Hi Kidlets, these are your notes today for Monday the 23rd of January. If you wanted to reference these, you could go onto my website, herscience.com, and look in the sidebar for the sub page and look for today's date and you could find this as well if you wanted to go back over this. So um, just as a reminder, we did go over the timeline of Earth um, last week. And we talked about when cyanobacteria formed, we talked about the changing atmosphere, we talked about the oxygen bloom and how species that were not adapted to be able to process oxygen um, were poisoned. And how we had this then boom of life in the last half a billion years as life got increasingly more complex. So these organisms were all aerobic and used a process of gas exchange in order to use oxygen and releasing energy from proteins, fats, carbohydrates, which is what metabolism is, and we inherited that from our ancestors. So the process of taking in oxygen, releasing carbon dioxide, and using that as a source of metabolism and energy. Um, so that's what aerobic organisms are, and that's what we evolved from. So we have our ancient ancestors that evolved to use the gases in the atmosphere um, to think for that. So we know the way that plants have evolved, that animals have evolved, and how our atmosphere has changed because we have this fossil record. So we can see that the fossil record, I'm going to use a lightsaber, has um, this record of early organisms which were very simplistic and um, they evolved to be increasingly more complex. So, but if we look at this time scale, we're not talking 4 billion years ago, we're talking only 650 million years ago. So we had all of these different periods within all of these eras. We're in the Cenozoic right now and concluding with the evolution of humans. So if you remember when we talked about our clock, human history would only be about 10 seconds on that clock. So if you were to draw it in on the clock, it would be thinner than a line of your pencil. So, and we can see from the fossil record, just looking at how species grew increasingly more complex. So you can think about this layer down here as being the bottom rock layer, and each layer going up is younger. So this is the oldest, and this is the youngest. So layers of rock, if you think about Vasquez rocks, or even driving through Newhall or areas of the 14, where you can see layers of rock where they've cut away to put in the highway, you can look at those rock layers, and what's the lowest is generally the oldest. So we already looked in class about the origin of Earth's water, and I mentioned to you how early impacts delivered the amino acids necessary for the building blocks of life. And we also had comet impacts, which delivered the molecules that then later became our oceans. And we had that really early on. So we know that the early oceans and early volcanoes had this process of shaping our early atmosphere. So the gases from the volcanoes, which were created from those early impacts that were then absorbed into Earth's crust, released into the atmosphere, that then influenced the rain that we had. We had a huge period of hundreds of millions of years of rain that gave us our oceans, and then we had water that flowed off of the land, shaping the morphology of, of surface features, and then bringing the dissolved minerals from the land surface that it ran over um, back into the oceans. This is one of the reasons that the ocean is actually salty because of that runoff from the earliest, earliest period of long rain that gave us our oceans um, was that runoff as it ran over silicate rocks um, and carried with it some of those minerals out to the oceans. That's what provided the salts. So if you look on your notes, I believe I gave you a table just like this and asked you to fill in what the percentages of each gas is. Um, so in looking at greenhouse gases, we think about CO2 as being the primary greenhouse gas, but there's actually a few others. And we think about oxygen as being the main component of our atmosphere, but it's actually not. It's only 21%, whereas nitrogen is 78% of our atmosphere. So the predominant gas in the atmosphere is not oxygen at all. Um, but CO2 is mentioned because it is the most powerful greenhouse gas. But we have a teeny tiny percentage of it, 0.036, less than a half of a half of a percent of the atmosphere is carbon dioxide. Whereas on Mars, it's 95%. And on Venus, um, you have carbon dioxide in um, 
combination with sulfur dioxide and sulfuric acid. So that atmosphere is actually entirely toxic. One breath and you would die from the inside out. But CO2 is an important greenhouse gas because it traps and stores heat at our surface. So it acts as a greenhouse. It prevents that escape back into space. So we want somehow some greenhouse effect. And if we were to think about greenhouse gases as being like a bunch of little dots in the atmosphere and we have incoming solar radiation, we want some of that because we don't want all of that heat to escape back out into space. We want some of it to remain trapped here to warmer surface. Sorry, that's a really bad picture. Um, but we want some of it to actually stay. Otherwise, our surface would be freezing. If we lost all incoming radiation back into space, so if we had this incoming radiation that then hit our surface and all of it bounced back, we would have no retention of heat at all. So we want some process to keep that here. So some greenhouse effect is fantastic, but we don't want it to get out of hand to where we're trapping so much heat that we don't have the natural mechanisms to release it and to counterbalance that effect. So ozone is another important greenhouse gas, and ozone, it's not written correctly here, ozone is O3 with a superscript, or I'm sorry, a subscript. Um, and ozone is a gas, so it's three molecules of oxygen that are bonded together. We think about it as being a layer, but it is really a gas, and it's concentrated in a specific layer called the stratosphere. So we have this area of maximum ozone at a specific spot in our atmosphere, but ozone itself is not a layer, it is actually a gas. And it's important because it blocks UV radiation. So without it, you would have very, very bad uh, sunburns. And we've seen an increase in skin cancer just in the last two decades since we've depleted a lot of this. And what happens when we deplete it is you break apart the O3 into O2 and a free radical of oxygen. So when we talk about the ozone layer as being depleted or being having a hole in it. Um, really, it's just areas where you no longer have O3, you have an O2 and a free radical. And this free radical is poisonous. And oxygen or ozone at ground level is poisonous as well. That's what we call smog. We don't want ozone at ground level. We want ozone in the stratosphere where it's actually functioning to block this dangerous UV radiation from the sun. So we know that we have this concentration of gases, and at our particular period in Earth's history, these gases are remaining constant because we have this constant cycling and recycling of matter within the atmosphere, within the geosphere, within the biosphere. So we have this constant cycling of, um, of gases being consumed, of being re released. So think about just in your body. We take in oxygen, we release CO2, and then there are natural mechanisms which re which collect CO2 and then release oxygen. That's what photosynthesis does. So this balance is maintained because we have an equal amount entering as in leaving. So we maintain that balance. That's usually what happens. However, the system is currently pretty out of balance and there are natural mechanisms that can do that as well. Um, local events um, like volcanic eruptions can release huge amounts of sulfur dioxide into the atmosphere and the overall effect is then we're blocking out sun and reducing the heat um, and then burning of fossil fuels and organic materials such as coal, natural gas, um, those things all also trap heat and increase our level of, uh, of CO2 and blocking that re-radiation of heat back out into space. So moving on to our layers of atmosphere, we can see that we have um, different layers starting at ground surface. So here would be where we are. So here you can see Mount Everest, here you can see some clouds. So um, this red line represents temperature and we differentiate where one layer ends and the next one begins by this change in temperature. So we can see this general trend of decreasing temperature in the troposphere. We live in the troposphere. The boundaries between each are called the pauses. So between the troposphere and the stratosphere, we have the tropopause. And you, if you can remember what happens to temperature in the troposphere, you can remember what happens in every other layer. Because if you think about going to the mountains, you don't go up there in shorts and a tank top. Generally, you're in warmer clothes. So we know that Earth's surface, the higher you go, the colder it gets. But then once we get into in the stratosphere, we have a general increase. And you can see that it actually is, that temperature line is vertical. And then when we hit this layer of maximum ozone, and remember that's not a layer, that's an area where the gas is concentrated, that the temperature gets warmer. That's in the stratosphere. Then when we have this layer where you have no change, that's the pause, the strata pause. Then we have our mesosphere, which is the coldest layer. And we can see that we have um, a meteor impacting here. This is the layer where meteors burn up. So mesosphere, we can see if we look right there, 
that that's about negative 90. That's a pretty cold layer. And then we increase in temperature in the thermosphere. And somewhere up here is what we call open space. So we don't have a specific boundary of where the atmosphere ends and the space begins, but somewhere around the thermosphere and the upper layer called the ionosphere is where open space begins. And this is where we have the phenomena of the aurora borealis, or the northern and southern lights. So again, we identify these different layers by changes in temperature. And the troposphere is 80% of the total volume of the atmosphere. Even though it may not look like it's the thickest, it contains 80% of the gases in the atmosphere. It's only about 10 miles thick. This is where we have weather that occurs. So the temperature is drastically decreasing for every 1,000 feet or so on average. And that boundary, like I said before, is called the pause. So all of the boundaries between layers end in the word pause. So between troposphere and stratosphere, tropopause. The next layer, the boundary of the stratosphere, is the stratopause. Those are the boundaries between. So our next layer is the stratosphere, and this is where our temperature gets warmer above the ozone layer. And this is where max ozone is found, and again, ozone is O3. That is the gas that's concentrated there, and you would need to know what that function is, that that blocks UV radiation. That boundary is the stratopause, and you would need to be able to recognize, if I gave you an image like that, what's happening to temperature, and what it is that actually identifies each of these different layers. And you would need to know that that's changes in temperature. Otherwise, it would just be one continuous layer, and it's not. So we have something that is changing the temperature in each layer. So our next is mesosphere. If we were to dissect that word, meso means middle. So that's another way you can remember that. Here you have very little ozone that's concentrated. So the temperature is getting very, very cold. Whereas above the ozone layer, you have sunlight that's reflected off and warming above that. But then as you get away from the ozone layer, the temperature is going to drastically decrease. And this is our coldest layer. Then above that is thermosphere. If we take apart that word, thermo, that, is, that means heat. So that is our warmest layer. Um, and there it's warming due to intense solar radiation. You have less gases that are blocking that out. You have highly ionized um, gases and plasma that are located above that. So that high energy and that collision of particles is creating that heat. And above that, we have the ionosphere that is also getting warmer. Um, and this is generally considered the boundary of open space. And there's no definitive boundary of there. So here's where we're going to stop. There are three more slides, but you can just push pause right here, and I will see you when I return. Please feel free to email me with any questions that you have, and have a wonderful day.